technical. It's not correct. This is not a technical bill. This is an extremely important bill that ostensibly seeks to set out to protect human rights, to prevent arms falling into the wrong hands, and to have peace and stability. Who could be against that? However, many of the things have already been, been said by Deputy um, Richard By Barrett, and I agree with everything he said. I must, might just put it slightly differently than he. First of all, it's unfortunate that there's no pre-legislative scrutiny report. Uh, I would have liked a pre-legislative scrutiny report. I know there were presentations, and I know I have the opening statement that was given to the Joint Committee on Enterprise Trade and Employment, and they were satisfied. But as I understand it, it was a one-day, um, and I understand how difficult uh, the, the onus of work on committees. But ethics comes into this, and ethics has been mentioned by one or two TDs. And where is the ethics where is the forum for discussing the ethics in relation to what we're talking about here? I would have thought the pre-legislative scrutiny on the committee would have been the time to tease out what we were doing here in terms of the new legislation which we were bringing in, which we have no choice, and I'll come back to that, and the implications of that, and which countries were singling out and which other countries were not singling out, and so on and so forth. I don't see the word ethics mentioned anywhere, and I think there was a golden opportunity lost. And that's brought home to me all the more because in the end of the opening statement that was given on the 29th of September 2021, the department has been engaging with the Office of the Attorney General, including the Office of the Parliamentary Council, on the drafting of the bill. Important legal questions have arisen and are being systematically addressed. For example, the unique interplay between national and new EU competence and export controls and the mechanism for handling appeals. So this is at the very end of this, telling us that important legal questions have arisen. I would say important ethical uh, have arisen as well, and nowhere has that been discussed anywhere. I want to thank you, Minister, and the Department for the work. Clearly, a tremendous amount of work has gone into this. It has taken me a huge effort to try and understand what is here, what we're doing, and then to articulate it. It is a, a, a fairly substantial piece of um, legislation. And... Uh, yeah... There's so much in it, you know, I could go around. I, I, I'd really like just to focus on it. And, and it, and it's difficult for me. There are eight parts and 74 sections. And there's a, a digest, once again, I pay tribute to the Library and Research Service for the digest. I don't know what we would do without them. And of course, as lots of people have acknowledged, the purpose of the bill is very good. It's to seek to control the export of dual purpose um, products and goods. That is not our competence anymore. That's the competence of the EU. And what we have to follow is the regulation that had direct effect on this country and we're allowed a tiny bit of latitude into the type of legislation we bring to, con to um, bring more openness and accountability into that process. Parallel with that then, we have the export of military goods, which thanks be to God, still theoretically, lies within our competence as to what military goods we export, and that's still within our competence. So theoretically, that's very good. So I welcome all of that. But then I look at it to see, and I, so I go back and I look at the report. Uh, actually, let me just say, in addition to no pre-legislative scrutiny, also the regulatory impact analysis has not been published. Now, this happened last week as well in relation to another bill. And in fairness to Minister Collins, he came back and told me it's now published. It was brought to my attention that on the Construction Safety Licensing Bill, when I spoke on that, we had a note from the Library, we have a similar note today, that the Department kindly made the uh, regulatory impact analysis available, kindly, out of kindness, but not to be given out, just for the purposes of TDs to read it. The exact same note today. So uh, that's particularly worrying, even though there's an onus on each department to publish those. And indeed, in the international monitoring of Ireland, we get very good marks for producing 
uh, the regularly impact analysis reports. We regularly produce them. We don't get so, the top marks for the quality of those reports and for the publication of them. So you might have a look at that, Minister. And I say that, and I'm particularly conscious of the report under the control of the existing Act, which is now going to be appealed. And again, that re this report is on the period the 1st of January 21 to December 21. There's no report for 22, even though we're now five months into this year. And where I read somewhere that there's an onus on the department to produce the report as soon as possible. But we have no report for 22. So we're speaking in a vacuum on the existing legislation. And then when I look at the introduction of the Taoiseach, who at the time was a TD and Minister for Enterprise, Trade and Employment, the report underpins the commitment to openness and transparency. And we are deeply committed to preventing the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, to supporting regional security and stability, to preventing terrorism and protecting Europe. All, all, all who could be against that. But he's talking about openness and transparency and providing a, ro a robust framework with this new bill. So I would think the first basic step in doing that is to have the uh, impact analysis published. The next thing, and it's already been mentioned by Deputy Callaghan, in relation to appeals that are secret, and how can we learn from that? In relation to the bill itself, I use the word surreal itself as well, very much. This is an experience for me in surrealism, because we're seeking to control the export of dual goods and services and military items in an open and transparent way with a piece of legislation does, that does not allow for openness and transparency. Because in addition to the appeal system, which is secret, we also have commercially sensitive reasons given for, as well. And everything is given in an overall package and we can't really see what's happening. But of what's published, what is published is also interesting. It, it's the criteria that must be taken into account, and I think it's eight or 10 criteria. One of those is in relation to our country, our Europe's attitude to countries and whether restrictions are in operation. And of, of, in this report, we're told 20 countries are now subject to sanctions. And what's interesting about that is one of them is Libya, another is Turkey, and yet we've done deals with these countries in relation to outsourcing our responsibility for refugees. And then, as well as what's interesting and what's included here, also interesting is what's not included here, the countries that are not included. Clearly, um, Israel is not included. Uh, Saudi Arabia is not included. Yemen is included, interestingly enough, a country that's been destroyed by the arms industry through Saudi Arabia and other countries. But Yemen is in there for restrictions. So we read with two eyes, really, or on two levels, what's in a report and what's not in a report. Um, the other, in the briefing document, I was told, which is a very interesting use of words, and again, thank you for the briefing note. I appreciate getting briefing notes, and they're very helpful. And what we're told on page two of that is, page, as Ireland, the, the list of military items subject to export control, is, is, export control is set out in the common military list of the EU. I understand now with this legislation, we're going to have our own list, and you might just clarify that, Minister, and will that list be public? I think that's part of this legislation. But after that, the next bullet point tells us, as Ireland does not have an arms industry per se. It's an interesting use of language here now. We don't have an arms industry per se. The military exports from Ireland are predominantly ICD components and mechanical devices of military standard. So per se, because in a very interesting article by Conor Gallagher, Way back in April 22, he focuses in on one company which is doing very well, a tech startup, and um, they're making software which he points out is of great interest to militaries, namely sophisticated virtual reality training and mostly very useful stuff for allowing engineers, our offshore wind engineers, to fix turbine blades hundreds of feet in the air, to, for peacekeepers to spot landmines. 
and so on. And it's one of the hundreds of companies, and I think you might have the up-to-date figures, there are over 500 countries, I think, in this country uh, exporting dual-use components. And the, the, uh, in this particular article, which is very good in a sense because it's zoning in on the very good startup company and how well it's doing, but how it can be used for other purposes. Now, this, he, he, he goes on to raise the, uh, the points out that the co-founder and the director of that particular company, a former cavalry officer, uh, who also set up the Irish Defence and Security Association, said, talked about ethics. And I go back to what I said, where is the forum for discussing ethics in relation to this? Um, In 2020, according to this article, despite the pandemic, 476 dual-use export licenses were issued. And each year they have increased. I don't have the 22 figures, but I do have the figures in this report for 21. And they're increasing every single year. 530 individual dual-use licenses were issued in 2021, an increase of 11% and so on. So, we're bringing in legislation to monitor control and bring in a more effective, dissuasive penalty system. Where is the information on the ground in relation to the existing act of how many offences were committed? Where do I find that information? How many prosecutions were taken? If, 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 not, if there weren't criminal prosecutions, how many other civil um, actions were taken in relation to... I would like to know that type of information. I appreciate it's quite clear that we have obligations under uh, Europe and the direct action effect of the regulation. But to analyse this properly, we need maximum information. And being told something is commercially sensitive is just... It's not helpful to openness and accountability. I sat in that chair this morning and various TDs were asking about openness and accountability and how we're, we're committed to that to some international body. So this is one area where we need openness and accountability in relation to what we're doing. And of course, we're bringing this legislation in at a time where van der Leyen makes a mockery, really, of peace, as she talks about increasing the amount of money, our money, going to the arms industry, the military industrial complex that will make the world not safer, not safer, in a mentality of them and us. Those of us who are inside the garden of the jungle, and Ireland is just about, isn't it, because it's a, 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 an island, we're inside that lovely garden that Burrell describes, and outside is the jungle. And we have friends then. And we, we're OK to export arms to those friends. We're OK to talk to Israel, notwithstanding that Amnesty have said they're operating an apartheid regime. But we don't talk about that because they're our friends. Saudi Arabia, semi-friends, so we're very careful there as well. But we'll use, demonise and use words that demonises countries when it suits the narrative. And I have a great difficulty with that. The invasion of Ukraine was wrong, unacceptable, illegal. But the failure to deal with other invasions in the past by America, repeatedly, actually, either openly or surreptitiously, and by other countries, and our failure to deal with Israel's warmongering, and being subjected to and being told that we're anti-Semitic or, or other comments like that, are utterly frightening to me. Uh, Minister, because I think that Ireland has a role, a primary role in being a voice for peace given our neutral status. And slowly that status has been taken from us. And more and more we're going into a consensus mentality and anyone outside that will be demonised, not our friends, not... We lose that independent voice at our peril. And in the context of a later debate today, I was looking at the Constitution in relation to Article 5, which describes us as an independent, sovereign, democratic state. We joined up with Europe, and I'm a committed European, for lots of reasons, 
the direction in which it's going, backing up a military industrial complex and making the world unsafer. And also a, a neoliberal approach and an ideology that's leading to more and more consumption and a planet that's in peril is not my Europe. And I don't think it's the Europe that the, most, the majority of Irish people want. So if I go back specifically to the topic here, there's a huge amount of hypocrisy, surrealism, and as Deputy Richard By Barrett said, Orwellian. That we're looking at controlling this in a little bubble, but not looking at the bigger bubble where the industrial complex, the military industrial complex is gaining enormous power with our money. It is impossible for me as an elected TD to follow the amount, the change in language where we now talk about peace enforcement and peacekeeping facilities. And we train the Ukrainian soldiers over in Cyprus, but we're not breaching our neutrality. Now I'll stand here and say we should give every possible humanitarian assistance to the people of the Ukraine. But we have a separate role as a neutral country. A very active neutral country is what we should be saying, we need this war to stop. We need to look at the military industrial complex. We need to look at what we're doing in Ireland with more and more companies producing dual components and a list of military uh, uh, items that's okay to export without an ethical discussion around that and without controls. I looked in vain to see when was the last site inspection in, under the previous legislation. And because of COVID, there was no site inspections. I don't know what site inspections means, but I'm told the ones that took place during COVID, understandably, to a point were virtual, although I would have thought it was possible to wear protective gear and get around that. How many site inspections have taken place? What problems have arisen with the existing legislation that we're now repealing? How do we learn from it? Are, is there enough staff in place to monitor what we're now putting through in this piece of legislation. Let's talk about an internal compliance statement from companies. What does that mean? Where will that be seen? I understand that there's a lot of small to medium enterprises um, who are struggling to understand their obligations. And I fully understand that. I'm struggling here myself, having read all of this. And I understand the government has taken some action to try and explain to them. But the bigger issue is, where are we going with the money, taxpayers' money, to start up companies that have dual purpose? Where are we going with that? A question was raised earlier on which caught my attention in relation to Catherine Murphy, research and development. How are we monitoring how that's going? How much time, money and research is going in to a particular type of research? that's going to aid the military industrial complex and still call ourselves neutral. Now, I want thriving small businesses. I want a thriving country. But I want a questioning democracy that looks at our part in the global military industrial complex that's killing people, innocent people on the ground, even as I speak in Palestine. The bigger ethical discussion hasn't taken place at all, notwithstanding your effort in the department. And of course, it's not for the department to do the ethical discussion. It's for us and for the committees. And unfortunately, it hasn't taken place. So I have serious questions about the surreal nature of what the government is doing, albeit to comply with our European obligations. And if we, we have to do this. The least we might do is making it as open and accountable as possible. Will the military list be published? What type of inspections will take place? How, how does that happen? We know from the health and safety going back in relation to the meat plants, the problems that were there in terms of lack of staff and how it was carried out. This is far more complex and equally as serious. And I have no idea how that will be done. I would think a review should be built into it as a matter of urgency, a review of how this bill is operating within a reasonable period of time. I could pick a time out of the sky, but within a reasonable period of time, an absolute review of it and an explanation finally for the um, regulatory impact, why it's not published. And there was one last question in relation, oh yes, the reports. 
Why is there such a delay on the reports? Why do we not have 2022? And why was the report for 2021 on this very important issue not published for a solid year from uh, until the end of the year when we got it? Or meet